a special presentation of LOBN with archaeologists Dr. Lawrence Garrity and Dr. Doug Clark, Excavating the Bible. Welcome to this edition of Excavating the Bible, what archaeology can teach us. This program is dedicated to exploring the contributions of Middle Eastern archaeology to our understanding of and appreciation for the Bible. I'm Doug Clark. I direct the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology at La Sierra University in Riverside, California, and I'm joined with two guests who have been part of the program, are walking through the Bible archaeologically. Dr. Larry Garrity, a longtime archaeologist, continues to publish, continues to be engaged in tours, archaeological <laughs> tours. I think a number of them coming up soon. Um, and a, a longtime friend and certainly a supporter of, of archaeology and its well-being, biblical archaeology mm -hmm. and its well-being. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kent Bramlett is Associate Professor of Archaeology and the History of Antiquity at La Sierra and has been working for how many years? About 20 years. About 20 years in the field. And if you put the 40 or so that Larry and I have worked together, we're talking about a century of, mm -hmm. uh, a happy century of mm -hmm. archaeological experience. Mm -hmm. I say happy not just because we like each other, um, because we do, but because it allows us to pull two important parts of our lives together. Mm -hmm. uh, archaeology, the science, mm -hmm. the discipline of archaeology, and our appreciation for the Bible. Exodus, we are in Exodus. We're in the fifth of six episodes on Exodus. What's your favorite part of Exodus, Kent? What would you say? Well, maybe the ancient geography, just thinking about the land, the places. Uh, um, you know, traveling through the wilderness is very different than much of the rest of the Bible in this towns and cities and villages. So it's that um, remote uh, sort of going back to this, this time, this contact with, with the divine that we see in the story of Moses at Mount Sinai. And, and would you say just as, uh, uh, as a personal aside mm. that you like spending time outside and, I do. and uh, <laughs> I do. hiking yeah. and enjoying yeah. the, sometimes the solitude, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the uh, activity of mm -hmm. cultures and so on? Mm -hmm. uh, am, am I fair? To That's fair, <laughs> right. Okay, okay. Especially since he's just visited 10 inter, uh, national parks with his family in right. the last few yeah, That was our weeks. Our road trip this summer. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. What would you say? I like the Exodus uh, a lot. Yes, uh, obviously the Ten Commandments is a highlight, and the whole Exodus experience. Um, I'm thinking maybe the uh, Song of Miriam is very important yes. because uh, <laughs> that was uh, composed and uh, sung uh, right after the dramatic events uh, mm -hmm. at the sea. And many scholars feel that that's the very oldest part of the Bible. That that poem uh, takes us back to the very beginnings of Israel. Mm -hmm. The language is the archaic. The language is archaic, mm -hmm. right? It is, uh, and we have a few other segments that are mm -hmm. archaic here and there, mm -hmm. uh, and poetry. Poetry tends to uh, the song of Deborah, mm -hmm. the song of Deborah in Judges five. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. also equate with. Mm -hmm antiquity mm -hmm. uh, in the Bible, some of the mm -hmm. oldest literature. Mm -hmm. But the Song of Miriam is mm -hmm. so, just so great, two lines. <laughs> right. uh, but it talks about the conquest mm -hmm. uh, over the dominating power. Mm -hmm. The horses and the chariots have fallen mm -hmm. and so on. Um, good, I like that too, I think mm -hmm. that's great. We want to talk about something that doesn't excite everyone uh, <laughs> on this episode, and it is law and law codes. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, we have some artifacts in front of us, and we want to take a brief look at these so that people won't be wondering uh, for the entire uh, episode what these are. So uh, Kent, talk about what is in front of you, and I'll have Larry think about some things over here. Well, these do date from, broadly speaking, the time period mm -hmm. of the Exodus. So it's in the late Bronze Age, 1400s, 1300s, that these, these come from. Um, there, some of them have Egyptian connections. The alabaster or calcite uh, vessels here are uh, a hallmark of Egyptian um, civilization and, and uh, trade. Uh, we have oil lamps um, and some small uh, storage vessels here. These are cultic vessels. These actually uh, lamps are used in the cultic context. If we're thinking about law in royal and religious context, 
context, these uh, chalices. Uh, the, um, and the stone will come back to this at some point, but it also is, is um, significant in a temple context. Right, right. Larry, what do we have over here? If we go over there and we're talking about cultic vessels, I suppose we would go to the middle where we have um, incense burners, um, the uh, little fenestrations yeah. right mm -hmm. there, right, uh, usually thought of uh, as for incense and an incense shovel made out of uh, bronze that is in front of it. Um, those would be uh, used in cultic uh, contexts. Um, on this side are a couple of little figurines. One is a human one, and one is uh, an animal one. Um, we always have the prophets in uh, the Hebrew Bible inveighing against uh, these little figurines. It was tempting to use them as idols or to um, uh, use them as fertility uh, figurines, that sort of thing. Um, and then, of course, we have a replica of what the Ten Commandments might have looked like uh, back in Bible times. Uh, the Hebrew that's on them is actually the Aramaic style of writing that is typical of the Babylonian captivity. Uh -huh. So we know that the a script on it, or we presume it would have been much earlier, right. the yeah. Paleo or ancient Paleo, Hebrew, right. right? But standing next to it is a little replica of another law uh, code, that one from the time of Hammurabi. Uh, just after uh, 2000 uh, BC or so, where the Babylonian king received the law from his god, Shamash, which is depicted there, and then uh, the laws are, are listed. So we have a context for what Yahweh did when he gave the law to, right, to Israel. Right. Mm -hmm. And the giving of the law comes from Shamash, right. uh, the mm -hmm. deity, the, mm -hmm. the sun god. Sun god. Mm -hmm. Given to, to Hammurabi. Mm -hmm. um, what does that signify about the role and authority of law in the society? Well, you think where laws were usually stored, the Hittite laws are in the temples. Um, we're looking at various mm -hmm. uh, cultic artifacts here. The Ten Commandments are stored in the Ark, in the sanctuary. Um, yeah, these are, um, they come from the divine realm. Mm -hmm. They come from heaven. And in all the cultures, not just that's Israelite right, culture. Right. And transmitted through the, what, political leadership? Mm -hmm. Political yeah. leadership. Mm -hmm. so There's no separation of church and state no. at that time. No. Mm -hmm. um, but it does say something about, uh, for, for somebody hearing the laws, that one ought to pay attention. This is, mm. this is divine mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. origin. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that uh, when we have a couple of kinds of laws, um, apodictic, that's a mm -hmm. kind of a technical term. What does that mean? What is an apodictic? Apo from dictus, from speaking. It's a command. And it's declarative, an authoritative, authoritative declarative statement and uh, you, this is what you do. Thou shalt. That's right. And what's the other kind of law? Case law. Case, Case law. law. Mm -hmm. If this happens, then this right. is the result. And I think on the Code of Hammurabi, it's, is it all case or, all or mostly? It's all case law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. strongly. So e even laws like if your ox gores your neighbor, mm -hmm. this is what you need to do. That comes from Shamash, too. Mm -hmm. That comes from the deity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we think, we think about the divine origin of all law. And why, why would that be the case? Because it's, it's something that happened in society. How would that come from deity? And, and why is that so important in this world, in this culture? I mean, why is it important that laws come to cultures anyway? I mean, what's the value of all these laws? Well, security. We Order. look at what happens when there isn't law in the land. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. chaos, or the Wild West, or Syria, northern Syria today. Mm -hmm. But um, it's also interesting that temples precede, uh, priesthood, uh, authoritative priesthoods precede uh, kingship in Mesopotamia. So the temples ruled the land mm -hmm. before the kings um, took over. Remember when the tabernacle was given to Moses or the outlines of it, God said it was so that I may dwell among you. So the temple or the tabernacle or the tent was the sign that God was among them. Right. And that's connected to this authority and mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. giving something to structure their lives, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. which is good. 
Posted. And, it and uh, this is all in a covenant context, you know. It's not the law just given out of the blue, but God has a covenant with his people. And he says, I've saved you um, from the hands of Pharaoh. I brought you to this place. And now if you want to uh, respond appropriately to the grace that I have provided you, here are the things that you can do that will seal that covenant. Mm -hmm. Well, we want to turn on that note to <laughs> some uh, to some slides and to think about the ancient law codes and the Exodus. Um, at some point, I want to refer people to a good book on mm -hmm. these ancient law codes that have parallels with mm -hmm. Scripture, and we'll do that. Um, maybe, though, first of all, some basic definitions. What what does Torah mean? I mean, Torah is sometimes used for just a law or a set of laws, sometimes for the Pentateuch, sometimes for the whole Old Testament. Mm -hmm. But what does it mean? Yara, the root, actually means to, to ascend in a direction. So it's often used with projectiles, mm -hmm. modern Hebrew with shooting. But um, in another he biblical Hebrew word, more is teacher. So it can be more abstract, the instruction to people of the direction to go. So Torah, which is an abstract of that, right. is are the laws which, uh, the guidance which directs people in a proper direction. We can call it instruction. Maybe. Instruction. Yeah. instruction. Mm -hmm. Guidance, maybe? Okay. Mm -hmm. So were people in the Old Testament happy about Torah or feeling oppressed? About Very happy. Mm -hmm. It was a guide that if they followed, they knew they would have success. And right. so you have an annual um, feast at the giving of the law on Sinai, it's called Simchat Torah in uh, Israel today. And people dance and uh, drink and eat and uh, have celebrations because they're so grateful that they've got the law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, in uh, at least one of the Psalms, uh, the law is more valuable than the finest gold. Mm -hmm. That just doesn't <laughs> seem to match. Especially maybe when we see the, the lights of a policeman behind us in our rearview mirror. Right. We're thinking law. We don't want law. Mm -hmm. But this was celebrated mm -hmm. and it was redemptive. It mm -hmm. meant order and security mm -hmm. and well-being mm -hmm. under a good God mm -hmm. who gave it to us. Mm -hmm. That's an extremely positive view. Mm -hmm. um, now, law codes in the Old Testament kind of do that. What do we have in the New Testament? Well, it's certainly a developed view of, of law in the Greco-Roman world. Um, it, it has a, a different nuance, I think, under empire than it did in the um, Old Testament period. So when Paul's talking about law, it doesn't sound as positive. No. 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 <laughs> um, this is something that uh, we tend, at least Protestant Christians, tend to filter the, the notion of Torah through that New Testament mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and more narrow. Is it by law or by grace? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. setting it up that way is, is a, a kind of, a, of an antipathy that we don't have in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the celebration of law, there's a mm -hmm. good lesson from the Old Testament mm -hmm, here to mm -hmm, celebrate this mm -hmm. goodness that God has given. So we have some ancient law codes, um, lots of them. Um, and let me just um, show a book here. Um, that I have found to be extremely helpful. Old Testament parallels, laws and stories from the ancient Near East, book by book. So mm -hmm. Genesis, law, uh, law codes that are parallel and so on. But this book is so helpful in providing this kind of context. Um, we have the law codes in the Bible. This gives us the wider world uh, mm -hmm. law codes from around ancient Israel. Mm -hmm. So we can understand something about their world and the context in which they receive laws. And then in the book of uh, Exodus, um, basically these two major ones. And we'll talk about both of them. But maybe just for a minute, Exodus 20, is that the only place we have the Ten Commandments? We have the retelling of the law in Deuter Deuteronomy, don't we, where uh, it's a second giving of the law. And uh, of course, they're very similar. There, there are 10 in both places. But the rationale, for instance, for observing the fourth commandment is different. Right. So the thought is that it's that apodictic, apodictic statement right. that you mentioned earlier that is the real law. Right. But depending on the circumstances, you could give different reasons for observing that law. Right. So in and one time it's creation, another time it's, it's Exodus. It's Exodus mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and redemption, basically right, redemption. Right. Mm -hmm. Escape from bondage mm -hmm. and deliverance mm -hmm. uh, is a good theme. 
Um, the covenant code, which immediately follows, is the case laws. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think most people would argue that what scholars call the covenant code, Exodus 21 to 23, is basically application of these principles of the mm -hmm. Ten Commandments mm -hmm. to everyday life. Mm -hmm. It's, it, is, um, it involves applications that don't seem to apply to us too much. We don't have slaves. Mm -hmm. Most of us don't have oxen. Mm -hmm. um, and if we do, we typically don't have oxen that are, that are goring our neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, but this is very important. In fact, it's repeated over and over. Mm -hmm. if, your oxen, if your ox keeps goring your neighbor, there is something you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So the covenant code, at least in the book of Exodus, uh, represents some kind of distillation into daily life of these In a society things. that's very different from ours. Right. So we have to extract the principles, but not the right. actual right. applications. And in a society that seems to be agrarian, that is agricultural mm -hmm. and settled, not the desert. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. a number of people have said that these uh, applications, some of them may actually come from times when they were settled in the land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we are going to be looking at some parallels mm -hmm. and see what we can find uh, among them. What do we have here from, oh, the treaty. I think, um, Larry, you may have said something about treaties, or mm -hmm. maybe it was Kent, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you referred to the, uh, the reasons given for observing a, mm -hmm. a command like the mm -hmm. Sabbath, and that fits right into part of the treaty formula where it's laid out what the suzerain or what the authority has done for mm -hmm. these people and why they should then uh, okay. accept this law. So it's reciprocal. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not laid down as kind of um, by itself, God just kind of comes out of the blue and says, hey, here are some things to do. Mm -hmm. It is as you'd set it up, mm -hmm. I have rescued you, mm -hmm. here's how we maintain this relationship, mm -hmm. and here are consequences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's interesting that uh, Israelites were not the only ones who had this kind of a situation with laws, but as you've indicated there, Egypt to the south, the Hittites to the north, the Assyrians to the east, all had their own law codes also given by their deities and uh, taught them that this is how they were expected to live. So um, Yahweh was not something, doing something different from the other gods as far as the people in the Middle East were concerned. Right. See, I'm wondering if that statement doesn't characterize far more of the Bible and what it says than we have given it credit for in the mm -hmm. past. And by that I mean that the biblical, the prophets, the biblical writers, the sages mm -hmm. um, utilized what was around. I mean, mm -hmm. people were familiar with it. Mm -hmm. So you utilize what's there. And the genius, maybe we could even say the inspired genius of the biblical books, is not that they came up with something out of nowhere, mm -hmm. but that they took what they had and adapted it and adopted it Mm -hmm. and then applied it in ways that were now tied to Yahweh mm -hmm. and not to Shamash or not mm -hmm. to Baal. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if, if that actually mm -hmm. isn't a way to think about a lot of scripture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you have Paul uh, quoting pagan poets and people have said, well, how can that be inspired? Well, it's very inspired mm -hmm. because it's a new application. People mm -hmm. knew the poet mm -hmm. and knew the poetry, mm -hmm. but Paul wants to put something in there Pin says, so "This is the way we're going with this particular uh, a poem." Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if that that particular approach to scripture might actually be helpful in lots of places. And when Moses is uh, sharing the creation story, uh, and te every single uh, sentence has as its subject God. God did this. God did that. God did the other. So the story that he's conveying isn't so much about creation as it is about who did the creating. Right. It's about God. And so when he talks about creating the sun and the moon, he doesn't use those terms. He talks about the, the, the lesser light and the larger light, you know, because those names attached with the sun and moon are actually gods that belong to the surrounding nations. So he doesn't even want to mention those names. So I think when you see what Israel is doing in the context of the neighbors, we see that the true message of those first few passages in Genesis has to do with the greatness and the goodness of God, Yahweh. In contrast to, to the others, Marduk, yeah. um, Bel, mm -hmm. um, my Shamash, go to, that, that's right. Seen. That's right. Uh, yeah. and, and the moon, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a nice way uh, to put it. So we have 
uh, treaty formulations that are part of it. Okay, who are these people? We have lots of law codes. Um, who are these people or groups? Look uh, at the dates for these law codes that uh, uh, show you that even before the time of Moses, which would be contemporary maybe with the Hittite codes, um, but the Syrians would be, the Syrian code comes more like uh, the United Monarchy time. But Hammurabi, the Sumerians, Unamu, mm -hmm. all are earlier uh, than the heart of Israel, uh, Ur even before Abraham. Mm -hmm. Ur Namu was the founder of the Ur, what we call the Ur three period. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know Ur with the story of Abraham. Right. right. But already the Sumerians were being um, sort of replaced by the Semitic speaking uh, Akkadian peoples. But this, the Earth period was a reversion to mm -hmm. uh, sort of native Sumerian rule. And we have this law code, and it has some very familiar laws in it that We're going to continue on down. So the later peoples borrowed, they kept this legacy right. and reused and reiterated. Right. Um, many of these concepts clear down to the middle of the Syrian period. Now, so in other words, law is not at all foreign to the Semitic uh, no. And structured in similar ways right, that, we would, right. uh, that we would know from the Bible. Mm -hmm. Now, Kent, is there anybody listed up here that might be able to claim to be the first to invent writing? <laughs> would there be, it's not the time period we're looking at here, but uh, what, what name would we think about here with the earliest use of writing? Well, the Sumerians um, invented writing. Um, Hammurabi is certainly a famous name. Right. Um, but it came out of the temple records. Right, right, of, right. Of now, do, is there a competition between the Sumerians and the Egyptians who uh -huh. are not on this list? Yeah, the poor Egyptians. Yeah. So, so who do you think was, well, came out first? Do you ask an historiologist or do you ask an <laughs> Egyptologist? There could be a heated debate. Right. Actually, if you ask me, I think it's the, the Sumerians just barely ahead and then the Egyptians probably knew the concept but rather uh, developed their own forms. But we're talking about forms. people who invented writing, or, or at least were very early mm -hmm. in the process. Mm -hmm. These are the earliest these are their codes. literate mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. right. that we know about. Right, right. So we can say history. Mm -hmm. If history means something written, history begins mm -hmm. with, these, mm -hmm. uh, with these groups. Right. Let's do some comparison, uh, Larry. Maybe uh, we're now going to the Urnamu uh, one. Well, Article 1 says, if a citizen commits murder, then the sentence is death. And Exodus 20, of course, tells us, you shall not murder. And we'll see elsewhere in the mm -hmm. biblical text the sentence is mm -hmm. death too. But mm -hmm. we, so we have a parallel here, and this is the earliest of those codes. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Sumerian code, Ken. If one citizen accidentally strikes the daughter of another and she miscarries, then the fine is three and one-third ounces of silver. In Exodus... When men strive together and hurt a woman with child so that there is a miscarriage and yet no harm follows, no harm, <laughs> the, the, the one who hurt her shall be fined according to, as the woman's husband shall lay upon him. If any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, and stripe for stripe. That is extending what we call lex talionis. Mm -hmm. Love the uh, retribution. Talon. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so something equal to another. Uh, a lot of people use this law today to um, to support and to justify all kinds of bad behaviors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My sense is that this worked well in a tribal society. Mm -hmm. But even Jesus says, "You have heard an eye for an eye and a tooth mm -hmm. for tooth." But I say, uh, go on to another direction. The principle right? here is something. A, a a punishment that's appropriate to the crime, right. not, and not, not overdue. More, not overdue. We, yeah. we know so often in tribal societies, just from um, working with some, that it can easily spin out of control. And pretty soon, right. it's you know you're trying to up the other right. your other tribe. And, mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Let's look at another one. Uh, this from the Sumerian quote as well, Larry. If one citizen rapes the daughter of another, who with the knowledge of the father and the mother of her household is walking about the city, then the citizen, if he swears at the sanctuary gate that he did not know she was the daughter of a household, is not guilty. So, I mean, the biblical <laughs> one here is a problem, already right. an ethical problem. Exodus 22, if a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall give the marriage present for her and make her his wife. Now, is that a better, at least from our modern sensibilities, the biblical one sounds a little bit better? Is that how you would 
that make is, an ethical that is, that assessment. Is, that is even something that uh, became customary in the last century yeah. for a lot of Christians, right? Right. Yeah. Right. That's how men got their wives. We, 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 we might want to say <laughs> that applying these laws directly and mm -hmm. literally mm -hmm. could be problematic mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. And we ought to do some interpreting and mm -hmm. putting them in context, which is why we like archaeology mm -hmm. so much, mm -hmm. to put it in context. Kent, we've moved to Hammurabi. All right, a good friend. <laughs> he keeps coming back in history. <laughs> he does. If a citizen kidnaps and sells a member of another citizen's household into slavery, then the sentence is death. And in Exodus, whoever steals a man, whether he sells him or is found in possession of him, shall be put to death. Pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. Would we do that today for kidnapping? I think that's an interesting question to ask. Normally, we would say no. Mm -hmm. um, m most countries in the world uh, don't have the death penalty, so this wouldn't apply directly. So. How we think about this and how we apply it, again, is a, it takes a principled approach. Mm -hmm. and but Americans being more savage than the rest of the world, we do have the death <laughs> we, penalty. We have maintained it with <laughs> some <laughs> enthusiasm. <laughs> right. Okay. Larry. If a citizen tunnels through the wall of another's house and robs it, yes. then the citizen is sentenced to death. The execution shall take place outside the tunnel and the body used to fill in the tunnel. <laughs> so you've got the cemetery that you've dug for yourself. <laughs> uh, see, that's such an interesting law. There it must is. be something mm -hmm. of context that would be helpful to uh, help us understand it more. But. And Exodus 22 says, if a thief is found breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for him. But if the sun is risen upon him, there shall be blood guilt, blood guilt for him. Why that distinction? do we suspect? Because you either did it in the dark or you did it in the light. Mm -hmm. And if you do it in the light, <laughs> you're, you're, you know a little bit more about it and can be sure. I think so. Kent, one more here. If a citizen strikes his father, then his hand is to be cut off. And Exodus 21, verse 15, whoever strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. Would we want to apply that when we were children, okay? <laughs> when we were children, would we want to have our parents apply that? Pretty severe, so. wasn't it? It was very severe. I've, had, I've heard people say that um, society might be better and more mm -hmm. sane mm -hmm. uh, and less juvenile delinquency today mm -hmm. if we did follow mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kent. Thank you, Larry. And thank all of you for joining us for this edition of Excavating the Bible. We hope the program has provided some food for the mind and for the soul. And we look forward to next time. Until then, think ancient, keep believing, and keep exploring. For Excavating the Bible, I'm Doug Clark.